Good evening, and welcome to the Brooklyn Museum. Thank, thank you. <laughs> thank you for joining us for tonight's Brooklyn Talk in honor of our special exhibition, David Bowie Is. My name is Margot cohn Ristorucci, and I'm the coordinator of public programs here at the museum. Organized with unprecedented access to David Bowie's personal archive, David Bowie Is explores the creative process of an artist whose innovative collaborations and characterizations have revolutionized the way we see music. David Bowie Is has toured internationally. I'm sure some of you have seen it in multiple locations. Yeah, let's hear it for the true fans. And it's taking its final bow here in Brooklyn, providing one last opportunity to experience this one-of-a-kind material. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce the exhibition's curator, Matthew Yakubowski, who will be bringing our special guest onto the stage. Please help me in welcoming Matthew. Thank you very much. How many people have seen the exhibition so far? Yeah, right after. <laughs> Thank you very, very much for coming. <laughs> um, so, uh, Tonight, our conversation is with uh, Jeff Slate and Tony Visconti. Um, I'm going to introduce Jeff first. Um, so Jeff is a recording artist and writer. He uh, plays Gibson and Epiphone, electric and acoustic guitars, uses Hofner basses and Vox amplifiers. He founded and co-founded several uh, groups, including the Mindless Thinkers, the Badge, the Jeff Slate Band, and he has an ongoing project with Earl Slick, who, has been, who was also a frequent Bowie collaborator. He has also worked with uh, Pete Townsend and Cheryl Crow, among others. Jeff is also a writer, and he writes music for Esquire magazine, and is an author of the biography, The Authorized Roy Orbison, which he collaborated with, with Orbison's sons. I personally would also like to add that, like me, um, Jeff was a member of David Bowie's fan club, BowieNet. So. <laughs> Jeff, do you want to come out? Oh, yep, there you go. OK. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, Tony Visconti. Tony was born in Brooklyn. <laughs> and uh, Tony Visconti's name is a name that I've been reading since I was a teenager on record labels and album sleeves. Um, Tony is an extraordinary record producer. In the late 1960s, Tony moved from Brooklyn to London, and among Tony's greatest and most uh, well-known productions include seven albums that he produced for T-Rex and with Mark Bolin. which included the 1971 album Electric Warrior, featuring the, fe featuring the song Get It On, which I'm sure we all know. <laughs> um, and, you know, Tony's made uh, dozens of albums, and I just thought I'd list a few of the ones that I'm partial to. Uh, Thin Lizzy's Bad Reputation. <laughs> Hazel O'Connor's Breaking Glass, The Boomtown Rats' Mondo Bongo, Altered Images' Bite, <laughs> Adam Ant's Viva La Rock, Larita Mitsuko's The No Comprendo. It's a very good album. You should listen to that one. <laughs> Uh, Morrissey's Ringleader of the Tormentors, <laughs> Angelique Kijo's Jin Jin, <laughs> Esperanza Spaulding's De Evolution, and many, many more. 
um, which I think uh, Jeff might cover a bit tonight. Um, but tonight we're here to discuss Tony's work with David Bowie. Tony worked on over 14 albums with David, and I thought I would list them all for you. Um, 1969's David Bowie, The Man Who Sold the World, David Live, which was David's first live album, Young Americans, which, which was recorded in Philadelphia, Low, Heroes, Stage, which is also a great live album. <laughs> Listen to Stage. Uh, Lodger, Scary Monsters and Super Creeps, Heathen, Reality, The Next Day, and Black Star. I'd like to introduce you to Tony Visconti. Good evening. Shout out to the Sigma Kids from Philadelphia. <laughs> Originally they told us we only had about 40 minutes, so we've only got about 20 left. No, no, I'm just... I, 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 Tony and I were joking yesterday that we could cover Black Star for 40 minutes, so... Uh, but we're gonna try to get through everything uh, as best we can. Um, they wanted us to both talk about how, you know, our connection to David and, you know, I could go on about David like any of you for the whole 40 minutes. He was he loomed huge in my life from a very early age, but, you know, I was a fan. I, I saw him from the outside. I crossed paths with him a few times, but nothing like Tony. So rather than me talk about how much David Bowie means to me, let's get Tony to talk about David and his work with him. Um, I think what was... We'll just start at the beginning and, and kind of, you know, how does a kid from Brooklyn find himself in London and in a circle where you're making Space Oddity, essentially? Well, I, I, uh, when I heard the Beatles, that was the clarion call. I said, these people are making better records than we are in Brooklyn and New York and all that. And, uh, I had to find out, you know, I knew all about George Martin. I saw A Hard Day's Night about 25 times. And I said, I've got to get over there somehow. And uh, I, a psychic told me I was going to meet an Englishman who was going to offer me a job. And that's exactly what happened. <laughs> I'm not making that up. And was that David, though? <laughs> no, no, it, was, it took, a, took a little while, it took yeah. a few months, but I met uh, my mentor, Denny Cordell, who was a great record producer in his own right, by the, by the water cooler in, in my publisher's office. And uh, he sp as soon as he spoke to me, I said, oh my God, you're English, you know. So I, you were in England, though. Yeah, I had, I, had, <laughs> I had even a worse Brooklyn accent than I have now. And uh, I said, you're in England, you're English. And he says, yes. And he goes, well, what do you do? And uh, I said, I'm, I'm the house record producer. I do demos for this company. And he goes, ah, oh, you're my American cousin. So he did, wow. he said he was the uh, record producer for Essex Music in London. And uh, only he was, a he wasn't making demos. He was making A Wider Shade of Pale by Procol Harum and uh, The Move, yeah. Denny Lane. Yep. Uh, and uh, those were his early, early productions, which when I eventually went over to work with him, I worked on those very same pe with those very same people. Yeah. So how did you first come across David and how did you end up working on that first record? Well, I met, <clears throat> I met David uh, by working with Mark Boland first. 
My, uh, Denny said to me, he says, you've got to find the group of your own now. You've helped me enough, and, and uh, I want you to bring somebody into the company. I was essentially an A&R man, too. Right. <clears throat> so John Peel was playing this band called Tyrannosaurus Rex uh, every Sunday on his cool underground show, you know. And I thought they were really good and different, and uh, I, I noticed that in the, the Time Out uh, newspaper, which in those days was just two, it was just a folded sheet, right. you know, it was four sides, that Tyrannosaurus Rex were playing right up the road, Tottenham Court Road, at a, a UFO night in this club that had a UFO night. So I said, well, I'm gonna check this band out. Maybe I'll sign this band. And that's exactly what happened. My, my very first foray into A&R and I, I, I had a, a, a pint and a pork pie at a pub. It's revolting pork pie. <laughs> and a pork pie, which is Cockney's for I, of course. Mm. And uh, then I went up the road and, and I walked down this uh, dark stairwell and I heard Tyrannosaurus Rex music, you know, loom up. And uh, I had a great chat with Mark that night. He was full of himself. You know, and this I, is the 12-string acoustic. Tyrannosaurus, right? No, no, well, he didn't have a 12 string. He, huh? he actually had uh, five and a half strings. <laughs> and uh, because the G string lost the peg, he had to tighten it with a pair of pliers. You know? We were all poor as anything in those days. So anyway, I, did, I, I brought him into the company, and uh, De Danny Cordell liked him. He said, I like them. I don't understand what they're doing, but we'll take them on as our token underground group. Cool. So we did. You know, I was working with Mark for about a month. And now this is this will answer your question, but it had to, I had to tell you the backstory. So yeah. he said um, he called me into his office. His partner called me into his office. A man called David Platts, who was who was the head of the whole operation, the CEO, so to speak. And he said, uh, "I'd like to play something for you." And he played me a few cuts off uh, David Bowie's first DRAM album when. He wrote, I, w I, I could live my dream, something like that. And the, the laughing gnome, we all know about the laughing gnome. <laughs> <clears throat> and I said, his voice is fantastic. I said, but he's all over the place. Yeah. And he goes, well, you seem to be, and he was referring to Mark Bowling. He goes, you seem to do well with weird people. <laughs> I don't know if that was a compliment for, for anyone, but he said, would you like to meet him? And I said, of course I would. Yeah, he sounds great. And uh, I think there was a picture of David on the, on the sleeve. And I thought he was a very young, nice-looking guy and all that. He said, well, he's in the next room. And it was kind of a setup. <laughs> and uh, so we went through this little ch through this other door, which went into the piano room where the publishers used to play their, you know, they put up the sheet music and they play music for a potential recording. You know, David was sitting in that room. And he, he, he was all smiles. He knew this was going to happen. I didn't. And the first disturbing thing about this meeting was I didn't know which eye to look into. Right. Fans will know why. And uh, I worked it out eventually. So we started talking about who we liked and uh, what music we were into. And we were both into kind of underground music. Sure. We liked Frank Zappa. And we liked The Fugs. Yeah. The Fugs were a, an early underground group in New York where all the members of the group were in their 40s, but they were kind of really dark people. And they were the first group to use profanity in, uh, in the, their album, in their records. You know, she, you couldn't hear them on the radio, so it was really underground. I think they, they wrote that unforgettable song, Fuck for Peace. Yep. So um, we had that in common. And then we had this strange man called Ken Nordine in common. We loved this this word play album that Ken Nodine made. He was a spoken, spoken word album. And he, the album we both loved was an album all about colors. And he would, you know, do, uh, he would recite a piece to, with jazz in the background. So we instantly loved each other. We, we liked the exact same weird stuff. And um, that was how, that, you know, that was our first day. We ended up um, talking about, this is funny, Roman Polanski, and he had a new film out. And we walked down, uh, they closed the offices, and we walked down Oxford Street. And then I said to him, um, I, I live in, um, where did I live? Near Earl's Court. So I said, let's walk down King's Road together. And we walked down King's Road together. And we noticed that one, at one of the art theaters, they were playing A Knife in the Water, the film uh, debuting, this film by Roman Polanski. So we said, 
shall we, shall we go in? <laughs> so we went in and uh, watched uh, A Knife in the Water, which was a great film. And we, we ended up saying goodnight at about 10, 10 p.m. in the evening. So that was like a real, like, good eight hour day we spent together. So how long from that meeting before you got to make that first record? And let's get right into that and, and Men Who Sold the World as well. Well, the first few records I did were singles that got him uh, dropped from his label. So I did a great job. Well done. Good job. <laughs> Good job. And they were uh, <laughs> Let Me Sleep Beside You and yeah. Karma Man and all that in the heat of the morning. Yeah. We, we great, got a, a great. I love these songs. You know, we got a great John Peel live radio show out of these. And, uh, you know, it didn't hurt him, but it got him five. But it, was a, it was a crap label anyway. <laughs> so we, uh, he got signed to Mercury. And uh, we, uh, I did do what David Platt said. He said, David Bowie needs channeling. He, he's all over the place. I said he was all over the place. And he agreed. And I'm an expert with weird people, you know, so... I said, the thing he does best is he writes and sings well play while he's playing his 12-string, kind of a folk rock idiom that he, he was into at the time. So we planned all of uh, the first album, David Bowie, around his style of 12-string of acoustic guitar right. playing. And I got a friends of mine, a band I produced called Junior's Eyes, and who had uh, a guy called Mick Wayne in the group, guitarist Mick Wayne, who eventually played the stunning guitar part on Space Oddity. Uh, on the song Space, Odd Space Oddity. So everything in like little steps, little right. steps, you know, we were leading up to something. But he was really, like, unlike Mark Boland, David still was undecided what he wanted to do. He was always mercurial. He wouldn't spend much time on anything because he just wanted to move to the next thing. And uh, it was reining him in was the most difficult part. The most enjoyable part was just that, that it was always sure. interesting. He wanted to do different stuff all the time. You couldn't nail him down. You couldn't tie him down. And after that album, we really uh, need, we saw what we needed. Like the, the, the folk rock thing wasn't working for us, you know. So we said uh, we, sh we liked Cream and uh, all the heavy stuff, heavy rock that was coming out. So we, uh, at the, the end of making that album, we were introduced by, I believe, Gus Dudgeon to uh, a guitarist called Mick Ronson. And we had, a, we had a John Peel show, a live one to play, with uh, John Cambridge on drums, who, who also knew Mick Ronson yeah. from, from Hull, from you know, Hull. where they both came from. So we got Mick for like a, a one-hour rehearsal to play with us. <laughs> and in that one-hour rehearsal in, in Beckenham, Kent, where we all lived in the Haddon Hall, we, Bowie and I looked at each other and we went, oh my God, he's the guy, you know. Yeah. This is, we're going we're gonna to make a heavy rock album, and Mick is the guitar player. And uh, we, t we asked Mick, and he said to me, he goes, well, if <clears throat> you're going to play, play bass with me, you've got to listen to Jack Bruce. I can't do the accent, sorry. <laughs> and uh, so I listened to Jack Nobody Bruce. can do the accent. <laughs> can't do the accent. So uh, I said, okay, you know, and, and I, I, Jack Bruce is basically a lead bass player. Yeah. I was also a guitar player, so it was a, a, a pleasant challenge. And we went into, uh, when we really got something going was when we made the album, The Man Who Sold the World, and I felt like we were all on the same page. Had and David written a lot of that before he met Mick, or was it written with Mick in his mind? Because they're very guitar-driven songs. Well, we rehearsed, we worked up the album in the basement of Haddon Hall. It was this little disused uh, wine room, you know, wine storage room. And... Uh, we could barely fit in there, but we, we cranked up the amps and we worked out a width of a circle down there, part one. We, didn't, we, we wrote part two in the studio. And uh, a few other songs, but I think after about four songs, we thought we could go in and start work. And they came very slowly. David was not prolific. Uh, he, he didn't write all the time. He thought long and hard, and then he would sit down and write when he had a, an idea. And this is something that happened throughout his career with me anyway. So we went into the studio uh, confident that we'll record the four songs and we'll jam some of, some of the other ones. And one of the most memorable jams was the part two of A Width of a Circle. Yeah. And uh, that came on, out spontaneously. We, we did that interlude and all that. And uh, I'd love to go back to the master tapes because you could probably have a timing on, 
it didn't take very long. And, and this is something that David uh, began uh, to work to this thing called pressure. And, it, and it, 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 when there, he was under pressure, he could write. You know, we had an album that we needed to, to deliver in two weeks. Right. So everything else was written and conceived in the studio. So, because time is of the essence, I, you know, they, they, we were, well, you know, we got a lot to cover. Um, you went off at that point, because you were a working producer by that, by that time, in, in yeah. the real sense. Hooked up with Mark Bowen and made some huge, huge records. Yeah, he was easy to produce. He just wrote three-minute pop songs. Even when he was t Tyrannosaurus Rex. Right. They were essentially, he, he always said, I would have had a band with, with Tyrannosaurus Rex, but I couldn't afford uh, an electric guitar. Right. And, uh, you know, he, in fact, the first few electric guitar recordings we did with Mark, he borrowed my Fender Strat, which you saw yesterday. I did. I saw it yesterday. So uh, Mark <laughs> was into that three-minute formula. He had it down pat. And, uh, and he was very prolific. He literally opened up a school book, and he would take any bunch of lyrics he just turned the page to and start singing that. I mean, he must have had like 60-odd song ideas, wow. which he could finish in a few minutes, you know. Yeah. David was the complete opposite. Right. So meanwhile, you're making Electric Warrior and the Slider, and David's going off and making Ziggy Stardust and before that, Hunky Dory. But then, you know, he finds huge stardom. You're becoming a name brand producer. And he wants to take a left turn, as he always liked to do, and was making Diamond Dogs. Yeah. And you got a phone call. Wow, you just made a quantum leap here. Yeah. I did. Uh, <laughs> this is why I'm here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, you know. Unless we ha do have three hours, I, and then we can do it. I could have been a spider, you know. I could have been a spider, yeah. but. Uh, well, we, should t we could talk about the hype Well, the we spiders. were fired, basically. We finished the album. We thought we were going to uh, rule the world after that. We thought it was a great album. And he got a new manager at the very last minute. He dropped his manager, uh, Ken. And, uh, and he got Tony DeFries, who said to him, you don't need the band. Get right. rid of them. So we were sacked, literally, two days after we finished the album. And we were all set to go on the road and back him up. So... Mick, Mick and, and Woody, this is Woody by it now is the drummer in the band, they went back to Hull with the tail between their legs. They were so depressed. And I went on to, like, I, luckily I had Mark Bolin, right. you know, who I was simultaneously producing. But yes, we, we'll do this quantum leap together here. Um, so Diamond Dogs, I, I built my own home studio. I had a good year, and my accountant says, if you don't use that money, you're going to have to give it to Her Majesty. So I said, okay, I'll build a home studio, and I did. And uh, just as I was finishing it, and uh, it was all installed, it was all working, I had no furniture yet, I was sitting on a carpenter's horse, you know, because <laughs> we were still sawing wood. And he phones me up and he says, I'm, I've produced my own album, and I've been looking all over town to uh, get a good mix. I've been going to Olympic Studios, and he can drop all the big studio names. He says, could you recommend any studio? Because I've, I've been through them all. I said, well, I'm building one right now. It's virtually finished. You, you want to come over and see it? And he goes, now? And I go, if you want to. So he was there in about two hours and with his uh, tape, you know. And I think we, I can't remember what we mixed that out. I think we started from the beginning, from the, the opening track, Diamond Dogs. And because I had just bought new equipment, I had the latest stuff. I had all the new digital stuff that you could do miraculous things with. Like the end of Big Brother, for instance, we uh, seize the word, we try to get the whole word brother into the sampler, but <laughs> you know, we didn't have enough bram in those days, so we got the bruh. Bra. Yeah. So at the end of it, you go, bruh, 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 bruh. But we were thrilled that we could yeah. even do that. Yeah. <laughs> so that's how we, we were just like, we just dove in like to, for this experimental, it was an experimental album, Diamond Dogs, and we went into experimental mixing, and every day he would go home with a, a, a copy tape and come back the next day. And you did some tracking as well, too. It wasn't just he, mixing. He did vocals and some more yeah. guitar playing, uh, something like that, yeah. Yeah, we, and we got back together again after like hey. the Ziggy days and all that, which I wasn't a part of. Yeah. Right. Well, then we get to a, a, a really major period, which is he's 
really trying to break big in America. DeFries wants him to break big in America. They're spending like they want to break him big in America, except on the band, but they're... <laughs> um, and, you know, he wants to, again, take another turn in the road yeah. and make a soul record. Yes. Where else would you make a soul record in 1974 but well, Philadelphia? Yeah, I would make it Atlantic Records personally, but uh, <laughs> he said, let's go to Philadelphia, and uh, he wanted to work with Gamble and Huff uh, yeah. originally, and they took an issue with that because he was uh, from England and they didn't want to give their secrets away to some skinny little white boy from England, you know, this, that's what they actually said, you know. And, uh, but we, so we got to this, he got to the studio and eventually got his own musicians in. He got Mike, Mike Garson in, who I believe is with us tonight. Hello, Mike. Hey, there hey he Mike. Is. I didn't say you could stand up, <laughs> but I'm glad you did. Um, and uh, we got uh, Willie Weeks on bass, who was one of my, he played with Donny Hathaway, one of my favorite bass players in the Great. world, and uh, Andy Newmark on drums. So these were, nobody was from Philadelphia in that band. You know, we ended up really, you know, we got the cold, we got the shade from Philadelphia. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so we had this fantastic band, and I think I arrived three days after they arrived. And I do believe, I'm not sure, maybe Carlos Alomar arrived the day before or the day I arrived, because I remember Carlos walking in with this little amplifier and his guitar and his wife, Robin, right. and this, this, this tall dude uh, who was a friend of theirs from the Bronx, a, a singer called Luther Vandross. Just a little. Who was about 18. <laughs> he was about 18 years old. And... Um, so it, that's, how, that's how the album started, and, we, and, and the first track I recorded with the band that day was uh, Young Americans. That wow. was the first cut. Did it surprise you? I mean, at that point, you'd known David for a while, and you'd worked on pretty varying projects, even at that early stage. You clearly knew he had a love for this music, but it yeah. was very different than anything he had done before. Did that surprise you? Did you just kind of go with the flow? No, inside it? every young British boy in those days, they wanted to make a soul record or they, yeah. they you know, it was the records that were the, the ones that they uh, imported most and, you know, right. would buy on the black market, you know, was soul music. And uh, when I was a kid, there was the same kind of music I listened to. I, I didn't realize that I, all my records came from Philadelphia or Atlantic records or from, especially New Orleans, because I was big fan of Fats Domino and other New Orleans artists, and, but I, I had no idea where they made these records, you know. But that was my favorite music, too. So for me, it was like, wow, we better do this right. We, we, we've got it in our DNA somehow, you know, and uh, we'll get it out, we'll get it onto tape. And was there any trepidation in that it would be, you didn't have the Philly sound, that it would be inauthentic or that it wouldn't carry the kind of weight that the, the RM, because R&B was at a real heyday in that moment. Yeah. Um, did you talk about that? Did you think about yeah, that? Yeah, there was a strong possibility that could happen, and I don't know, we, we, our radar was good. We had, um, mm -hmm. uh, who was our sax player? David Sanborn. David Sanborn, who... <laughs> Just who was, a little guy named David no, Sanborn. No, no, he was terrific. You know, he, he came from St. Louis, and that's one of the most musical cities in the, in the United States. Everybody was on the right page. Uh, Mike Gosson was as funky as anything on that. You yeah, know, I don't know. Yeah, we, very. You grow up in Brooklyn, you hear this music too. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. We 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 were like three songs in, and we knew we were onto something. And Luther kept, Luther was a godsend, and and Carlos, they came from the Bronx, and they kept us very honest when it came to like the credibility. Sure. And Lu Luther wrote all the backing vocals. And one of the songs, he wrote a song called, uh, which became Fascination. Yep. But he, he, that's how Luther got the gig. He, his manager sent a tape of funky music right. to, uh, to David's manager. And David liked the cassette. And he asked for, like, Carlos was on that, and Robin was on it, and Luther was on it. That's how we got that crew down with us. Interesting. And uh, so, but Luther was the arbitrator. You know, he said, no, you got to do this. That's not right. And... He was always referring to Aretha records, too. Ah, yeah. And like, I mean, he was so good for us to be there. 
At the same time, he's out on the Diamond Dogs tour, which became the Philly Dogs, Soul Dogs tour. Yeah. You recorded some of those shows, and you went to a bunch of those shows. Yeah. Talk, talk a little, that, that tour is so legendary, and it isn't really properly filmed. Um, talk a little bit about what, what it was like and what you saw, what you witnessed. Yeah, well, Diamond Dogs had already been released, so the, the tour was meant to be a Diamond Dogs tour, and right. yet there was Carlos and Luther and Robin on the stage, and... Um, those they they did I forget they did a few of the the, the Philadelphia songs wood, live yeah, yeah. 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 oh the, uh, can you hear me yeah can you yeah. hear me and all that and you could see the the crowd didn't know these songs yet you know they're cheering all the other ones the classic ones of course but they were quiet you know for a song like can you hear me I really mi recently mixed this album right. and uh, I, I I could hear all the dynamics going on in the audience I could turn up the audience mics you can't people would. Like, nah, we're <laughs> talking. You know, I haven't heard this. This is not Bowie music. You know, and all right, stuff. right. But afterwards, the, the, the songs went down very, very well. And uh, it was a transition. You're actually seeing an, a, the brand new album that's released and the album that's about to be released right. in the same shows. It was incredible. Right. The production, was it as amazing as... Are we talking about the one with the bridge? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, we are talking fantastic. about the bridge. Yeah. Yeah, so he had this set built, you know, it was Hunger like, City. Hunger City, it was called, yeah. And uh, <laughs> so many times the bridge stalled. The bridge, you know, that was a draw, uh, I forget what you call those kind of bridges, but it went up and it went down and all that. And sometimes he was stuck in the middle and sometimes <laughs> it wouldn't work at all. And uh, was this the Cherry Picker one as well? It was, yeah. yeah. Space Oddity. Space, I did Space Oddity in a, in a big hand that was in a hydraulic arm. And it came over about maybe five rows and occasionally that arm got stuck and he had to like climb down the pole to get back on the stage. <laughs> but his, his imagination was fantastic. Who else did this? Right. No one else put on a show like that. He was years ahead, ahead with, a, with a, such a theatrical um, presentation. And also he had his choreography worked out by Tony Basil. Right. Okay. And uh, she taught him things like you never walk from here to there without doing something. And she taught him all little moves, like if, say, Slick was going to go into a solo and David walked to the side of the stage, he would go like... Right, Just right. that, you know, she, she told him, like, you just don't go plonk, 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 plonk. You know? huh. And so everything about that was just, oh, it was, you know, you were gobsmacked. Interesting. You went off and made some records. He went off to L.A. and dabbled in the occult and made <laughs> station to station. Yeah. Um, and then he wanted to get away from the sort of rat race in Los Angeles. Yeah. And you got a phone call from he and Brian to come and make what became Low. Let's talk about the Berlin Trilogy a little bit. Yeah, well, that was great. Um, I hadn't heard from him for a while, and uh, I knew he was... At the time, he was living in Berlin. But... Um, he booked the, uh, the, the honky chateau, chateau yeah. in Chateau d'Eroville in France. And uh, he and Brian uh, phoned me on a, a, you know, they were on extensions in, in Switzerland. Oh, was it Switzerland? No, it was Berlin. No, it was Switzerland. They were calling from Switzerland, that's it. <laughs> no, they were calling from no, Berlin. It was <laughs> <laughs> no, it was Berlin. No, it was I don't know. Yeah, something like that. So anyway, they said, we have this idea based on uh, Brian's ambient music, and we're going to do a, a... They had already had the concept. Were of, you familiar with Brian's work? Yes, of course. Okay. You know, I, I was a uh, Roxy Music fan as sure. well. And um, so anyway, it said, we're going to do like... Uh, we're going to do rock songs and an ambient side too. This is wonderful. We had vinyl, and you could actually have a side one. And then side two is another vibe, you know. Well, they took full advantage of this concept. So uh, they said, well, what could you bring to the table? And that's the first time I ever heard that expression, you know, what, a roast beef? You know, <laughs> I, I don't know what that meant. What did I, but I was quick, you know, I caught on. Brooklyn. And I said, well, <laughs> and they, David knew that I had this home studio. It was still in my home. And I said, well, I got this new thing from Eventide. It's, I've got the only one in the country and it's called a harmonizer. And uh, they said, well, what does it do? And I, I, and I started giving them the, the technical information. Well, you could change the speed, but not the, 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 the. I said, it fucks with the fabric of time. 
<laughs> and, uh, you will, see, they don't laugh anymore at that. <laughs> they know this. They, they're waiting for they to tell the yeah. punchline. I should come up with a different phrase. Like yeah. That. yeah, but it's it is what happened, yeah. you know. So anyway, it fucks with the fabric of time, and, um, <laughs> and they, <laughs> they both they both whooped in the background like woo, right. like, woo, woo, things like that, you know, in the background. And uh, so I said, you're going to love it, and we'll use it, and all that. So I, that's, what, that's what I brought to the, the chateau. And, uh, and, and at that point, you, you've said this a few times, but was it at that point that you knew this might never see the light of day? Was, or, or did that come later in the process when you were physically with David and kind of working on the record? Oh, th this is, I mean, uh, the, he, most records, he started out saying, we're doing just demos. I'm not sure this is going to be an album. But... Oh, that's how he prefaced this uh, particular album. He goes, mm. would you mind spending a month with Brian and myself and maybe nothing coming of it? <laughs> oh, said, all right. I'd love to spend a month with you and Brian. I don't give a shit what happens. Yeah, really, <laughs> really. In France. <laughs> oh, it's so great. What a, what a great vacation. You know, it was yeah. September. The Chateau, it was beautiful. And uh, that, that's such a beautiful area of, of France, North, North France. So... Yeah, that's that's And, how and when you got there and you heard the songs and what they were working on, again, it was completely different and, yeah. a, and, a, and a real change. Yeah. And, and dramatic for somebody who, at his, he was at a pretty high stature, he just had a number one hit in America with fame. Yeah. Um, did, did that ring true to you that maybe this won't see the light of day? He, or did he, he just kind of. He just cast it aside, he, yeah. he wasn't interested in the fame style anymore. He would not be tied down, and this was evidence that, you know, he's sure. not going to be tied down to a, a style. He often said that out outright. I'm not going to do, oh, RCA wanted him to do Young Americans 2. Of course. That was exactly what they said. Let's call it Young Americans 2. <laughs> so, um, no, we, we started doing, making radical sounds right off. I, I altered the drum sound immediately with the right. harmonizer, which Dennis Davis went crazy over. He loved it because he realized uh, it, it was the, the first like foray into changing pitch but not time and changing time but not pitch, you know. And he realized that with all the glitches in the machine, he could play it with uh, dynamics. Yeah. So if he played... Played it, to the harmonizer. If he played it, the harmonizer very hard, you know, he played this, it would kind of splutter and go burp like, like that. Right. But if he hit it a little softer, go like that. And he's having a ball in the headphones. No one else heard this in the headphones when we were recording. They did initially, and they said, oh, turn that off. That's terrible. Ooh. That's what they said. Ooh, turn it off. So we did, and it was only on playbacks when I would go, uh, let me just put the harmonizer in a little bit. And I put the harmonizer in, and everyone, after a few days, got used to it. And uh, it, it, it was such a radical sound. I had one little bit of pleasure I had was for months after that album was released, I had all my f record producer friends phoning me up and saying, come on, Tony, how did you do it? Because I still had the only harmonizer. Ah. <laughs> the, the sessions were, I mean, Iggy was around, it, it, you had a, the core band around. You moved really quickly from Low into Heroes. It was a really brief pause into making Heroes. And yet, they're very different albums. Um, they have the same template, maybe, but yeah. the sound of Heroes is very different. Is it, is it, in your mind, do you see it as part one and part two? Hilo is almost sort of the, the germ of the idea, and Heroes is the fruition. I mean, how do you, how do you see it? Well, it, it was like a travelogue. You know, we actually got a French kind of sound in yeah. France, and for Berlin, that just turned David into some kind of passive, well, I won't say the word, uh, <laughs> Nazi. <laughs> no, he got, he got like, wow, because he were, the Reichstag is there, and the yeah. Berlin, and the bombs, and, and like the city is blown out, you know, really bad. And, and, and the, the studio was where a lot of the propaganda music for Hitler's rallies was re recorded. Right. And it, the whole place made you feel like very strange. It was very strange to be there. And you could summon the, that manic kind of uh, energy, that, man, that manic aggression, which is all over Heroes. It's all over that album. Yeah. There's, there's no deep love songs on that album. You know, it's, it's all about being a hero just for one day. The song's about um, 
an angry, loser, alcoholic couple. You know, everyone thinks it's about heroes. It's not about heroes, folks. So, like, and the themes were pretty, were pretty aggressive. Joe the Lion is a very aggressive song. And, but we had, the nice thing we had was the, the that studio. Because Denny Cordell taught me, if, well, he taught me two things. Get a great bass and drum sound. And the other thing, he says, if you're in a good room, take it home with you. Uh -huh. He says, record the room. Always record the room you're in if it's a good room. And you couldn't find a better place than the grand the Grand Hall in, in Honda Studios, because it could house uh, 100 pieces and a choir. Right. You know, it had a riser. You could put about 50 people on the riser singing, you know, Freude Schöner and all that. And, uh, but we had a, like a, you know, six musicians using up that whole room and using all the ambience. And I put, I put mics everywhere. Even, even Brian Eno played uh, his little, uh, briefcase synthesizer live, but I didn't take a DI, I put a mic on it, and you could hear the, the piano coming down that mic, some of the drums coming down that mic. The, the whole album is charged with this uh, Teutonic ambience. Right. The, so, so Lowe does have a more sort of chateau-y French countryside sound, and, and Heroes has that Hansa sound, but he was, sound. he was in a different place too. Low, yeah. he was in a low place. He was dealing with a lot of stuff. By the time he got to Heroes, did he have an edge? Did he, had he picked up, he was a sponge. Did he pick in, up on that kind of Berlin vibe? No, in, in, in Berlin he was very happy and, and he, he was really, he had a lot of confidence. Uh, he and Jimmy uh, were really great friends. They go, Iggy Pop to you. And, uh, <laughs> and they, me. They, they, go, they go, all, go all over town, go to the clubs. I used to go with them to all the nightclubs, which were really radical. There was one phone, uh, there was one club that had, every table had a phone. And this is from the 40s. You see these in old black and white films where yeah. you could phone another table and, and all that. And you know, if you saw somebody you liked, you just, it's a table four, and you go like that, hello, you know. Can I buy you some champagne? Uh, and things like that. So we went to all the, the we saw all the local bands. That's a, that was the difference between David and, say, Mark Bolin. Mark Bolin, if he was in Berlin, he would stay in his, hot his hotel room. David had to go out and right. soak up the local stuff. There was very little of that to do at the Chateau because we were about 13 miles outside of uh, Paris. Right. And he was also going through law uh, problems. He was being sued by a former manager, and he often had to go to Paris for a... a, a, a depositions. A, depositions, yeah. and, and, and he would come back so pissed off and so angry and depressed eventually, you know. And that's exactly why he called the album Low. When we were, when I was getting ready for this, I, I noticed that Heroes didn't even crack the top 100 as a single. I mean, now we think oh. of it as one of his greatest songs. Were you even aware of that? I mean, you talk about the confidence you guys had. And well, you're talking about the U.S. Because yeah. it, it was a hit yeah. in, in England, but in the U.K. and Europe, but it didn't make the number one. That's true. Yeah. Um, and, and yet, it was sort of the temp... It was... I mean, you guys were kind of creating the future. I mean, the whole new, ro new, ro new romantic scene, all these things that happened in the 80s, the Adam Ant album that, you know, everybody clapped for was invented in Hansa almost, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and let's talk a little bit about Lodger because it came, you know, pretty quickly. Again, he did a big tour yeah. and you recorded stage. But we've talked about Lodger a lot and I think it, it's underappreciated. It's probably as great an album as Scary Monsters, which yeah. is, you know, considered his, one of his great works. Now that it has a new mix, we can everybody can hear it in a different way. Yeah. But but talk about what you were trying to do and what was going on because that was made largely in New York. Well, a little Br in Switzerland. Brian and David talked about making a triptych. You know, this yeah. this album. This is going to be the third and final album in the series, and there was a great idea. Uh, we were we were hindered by. I mean, we got we got some great tracks. I mean, it, uh, unappreciated how great some of those tracks are. Yeah. And the remix I did brought out more harmonies, more little percussion things going in the background and better sounds on, on everything. We were actually, we wanted to go more in the direction of Scary Monsters, getting this big, a, a glossier sound or a deeper sound, uh, a bigger sound, but 
first, it was the only studio, this studio in the mountain studios in Switzerland where the walls were carpeted. It was such a dead <laughs> sound, you know, that the floor was carpeted, the walls were carpeted, and, you know, they had the acoustic tiles in the ceiling. And the purpose of that studio was to record the concerts at the big hall underneath us. That's where they had the Montreux Jazz Festival sure. and, and all other sorts of concerts. And uh, Queen were the only band to successfully rent the hall. So if you had that little cabin of a studio up there and you had the hall, then you had the sound. We tried to get it, but we couldn't get it. So we had to record everything. It was stuffy and hot. And I've got like so many pictures of Brian Eno topless. <laughs> well, you took the room home with you. I mean, that's what, yeah. that's what came, that's what ended up on the tapes. Yeah, right, that too. Great, it was absolutely um, great. And then you couldn't really find a proper studio here in New York to mix in. No, so we came to New York and there were some great studios here in those days, uh, Power Station and... Uh, Hit Factory. Uh, Hit Factory and all that. And I Record think, I, don't, I don't know where we ended up, the Hit Factory, but we wanted Studio A and we got Studio F instead. <laughs> it, it was such a time where every studio was booked in New York. There were so many people making records. Yeah. Uh, Mick Jagger, for instance, visit, visited us in the studio and he like, looked around and he says, it's pretty, you know, dank studio. And go, well, that's all we can get. And then he, we, we were, we, David played him a, a track and, and Mick continued to put it down. Like he was, well, you know, that drum, I don't know if that fill was any good. He kept, kept trying to tear it down. And I said, will you stop, stop this? I told him, I said, we why are you doing this? He goes, oh, okay, I guess I'll go up the road and sabotage Joni Mitchell's album. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but he, he was playing a mind game on us. Of course you know? he was. And David's energy was going, oh, oh. You know, we, we already, we didn't feel good about being in Studio F. It's a good friend. And here's Mick Jagger <laughs> trashing our work. It's only Mick Jagger. <laughs> um, well, the new mix is highly recommended for those of you who haven't heard it. D dial it up, it's, it's worth hearing. I got to hear it very early and it, yeah. was, it was... It sounds great, I mean, if I say so myself, but David uh, heard the first five tracks remixed and I said to him, we were making Black Star at the time and I said, I've got a surprise for you uh, because, you know, he was working on Lazarus and I had some time on my hands and I said, let me just start getting into this because we always said we were going to remix it. And we, when do you book time to remix an album? You never right. do. You know, right. you, you book time to make a new album. So I did this in my, my spare time and I got five tracks up to good shape and as soon as I played the first 15 seconds of Fantastic Voyage, he, he just, his, he broke out into this big grin and he, and he played it, and I said, you want to hear African Night Flight? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. And he smiled broadly again, and he, he says, this is fantastic. He goes, tell, uh, tell Bill Z I'm giving it the green light, Bill Zisblatt, his, right. his, his lawyer. And, uh, and I said, well, I, I, I'm so happy. You know? So I, I finished it after he passed away, but he, he gave the green light, he loved it, and he approved of the, the direction it was going in. Yeah. Um... But you were able to book time, and he did have great songs when you got back together for Scary Monsters. Not very long, maybe six or eight months later. It was very soon. Yeah, we, well, you know, people made albums more often in those days. Yep. Nowadays, I mean, you make an album and people tour for two and a half years on that one record, you know, Lady Gaga, for instance, you know. And uh, <laughs> she's, she's still selling that Joni album. It's about three years old now. She's still, <laughs> she's on the Joni tour, you know. I'm not putting it down. I'm saying that's how it is now. He's putting know? her down. But that's no, I'm not putting her down. <laughs> oh, did I say that Joni album? But, but I mean, in those days, you could put an album out. You can put two albums out in a year, which I often did with T-Rex. So it was wonderful. You know, you'd get all that feedback, and then you could go right back in and do your next album quickly with all the, the feedback you got from reviewers. And the ultimate feedback is record sales, you know. Well, and then, and then again, like Low and Heroes, lessons were learned on Lodger and you took those into the sessions for yeah. Scary Monster because it really was the culmination of everything you were trying to do and didn't achieve maybe at the time yeah. with Lodger. Talk a little bit about those sessions. Well, Scary Monsters, we, we, we always used to preface every album, starting with the Manasola World, let's make our Sgt. Pepper's album. Right, right. Because we thought, we didn't really like that album very much. We loved Revolver, but 
Sergeant Pepper's represented the most kind of overproduced album ever made. Like it was really a, a big production, sometimes to great excess, but like it was amazing that somebody got to make an album, it take nine months to make an album. So we wanted to have an album that was as classy as that. And Scary Monster started out with that, but I think we came very close to yeah. making a really great album, you know, that, that, that just hit all the marks and all the points were, we, were made. And uh, again, I would say only half the songs were written. It's No Game was a song he claimed he started when he was 16. Right. So that, that's how unprolific he was. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he finally finished it when he was 30 something, you know. So It's No Game probably kicked it off. And uh, Scary Monsters and Super Creeps was a backing track, you know. Uh, Ashes to Ashes was a, a, had a working title of People Are Turning to Gold. But what we were expecting, what we were making was, t we were working with textures. We, we, we right. met a New York guy called, um, oh, he played, he was the first person who had an electric uh, synthesizer guitar, a synthesized guitar. I was just speaking to his manager the, the other day. But anyway, he said, I, I can make my, a string section out of my guitar. And he, he, we asked him to come in. We, we had a lot of people coming into that, you know, off the street, basically. Right. And he played this beautiful, these beautiful string chords on his electric guitar. And I recorded it in the stairwell of the power station. Hmm. And um, that, those are the strings on Ashes to Ashes, you know, the, on the chorus. You have this big, huge string section. It's this guy, Chuck Hammer. His ah. name is Chuck Hammer. And it's Chuck strumming on the old electric guitar there, the synthesizer guitar. And again, that album really soundtracked and, and pointed the way forward for many artists. For, for the 80s, but not for David. He went off and had a pop career, essentially, for the next 10 years, mm -hmm. and, and then Tin Machine. And you hadn't worked together in, you know, 15, almost 20 years, and you reconnected. Talk a little bit about how you got back together with him for, well, Toy, and then, I guess, uh, Heathen and, and Reality, and then we'll kind of... Uh, yeah, I was in a studio producing a band and uh, a punk band, and it's Degeneration. Oh, yeah. And Joey Ramone was always coming to those sessions. It was, it was really nice. It was in a small studio in New York. And uh, my, my wife phones me, and she said, David's about to phone you. I gave him the number of the studio. I go, David Bowie? Because <laughs> I hadn't seen it in 14 years. He goes, yeah, David. And Degeneration, said, I'm leaving. No. I, I said, <laughs> I said what, what did he say to you? He said, Where's Tony's head at? Ah, interesting. And uh, she said, it's, it's in good shape. <laughs> <laughs> What's she going to say? It works well. It's terrible. <laughs> so, so then he uh, phoned me up and he said, uh, I want, I, I, I'd like to work with you again. I've got a, a couple of things. I'm doing something that I wrote in, uh, I think in Nassau. He, he wrote a song called, uh, no, he, he didn't write it. He did Mother, the John, uh, John Lennon cover right. of Mother. He goes, I want to uh, mix that for, uh, Yo Yoko was doing a, a tribute album for something, and, and that was a track we worked on. So it was the first thing we worked on again, just feeling each other out. Then he got a, uh, a call for a, having a track in a Rugrats film. <laughs> I know. True story. And that, was, uh, that ended up on Heathen as Safe in this uh, Sky Life. The safe in the Sky, it's a beautiful song, absolutely yeah. beautiful. And uh, nothing yet, e except when uh, Toy came along, because he started working with Mark Platty, an excellent yeah. producer, and, and he was all set up with this, another crew. And yeah, you can clap Mark Platty. Yeah, yeah. Give, give Mark a shout out. And, uh, and uh, he was already working with, with, with that crew, but he, uh, and, and Mark produced Toy with David. Right. And, and David just didn't like the mixes. And I, I hate to do this to him. I don't like to mix another producer's production, you know, unless something like this comes along. David told Mark first, he goes, I want Tony to mix the album. So it, w it was a little delicate there. It was sure. walking on eggshells. And, sure. And I invited Mark, and David and I invited, I said, you could come every day and come at the end of the session when I've got a, a decent mix up and all that. And so Mark was there to, to uh, give his input. So that, that's how I really got back with David. You know, it kind of worked out well. How had David, I mean, a lot had happened to him. He was 
married, he had a kid on the way, well, maybe not at that point yet, but, you know, a lot of time had passed. He had had a really epic career in the 80s. Um, how had he changed? How is he the same? Was he kind of the same guy you met in 19, you know, back in, on Tottenham Court Road all those years ago? He, he was uh, pretty much the same. Like, when I first met him, like, in Beckenham, when right. he was a real, like, he was, he was wide-eyed again and bushy-tailed, you know, he was, he was lovely. His energy was beautiful in, in the, uh, this would be the early 90s. Yeah, early 90s it was. And uh, he, he uh, I think, I didn't know this until later, he had given up drinking already, which mm. made an enormous difference. You know, he was, he was really healthy, he actually had a little weight on him, mm. and he wasn't really like the thin white duke anymore. <laughs> And uh, he, he was still recreating himself, reinventing himself, because eventually he proposed that we... Uh, I was living in West Nyack at the time, you know, really far out of the city. Yeah. But I had a nice two, maybe three-story house, if you count the loft. And I had a little studio up there. And he said, I'd like to make some demos with you. Uh, do you know where we can go and make them? And I said, I've got a home studio. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, history repeats itself. With the sawhorse? So he came up, yeah, we know we, we graduated from the sawhorses. We had swivel chairs. Oh, wow. Yeah, Staples. Invention. Yeah, it was really great. Uh, so he came up to West Nyack and he stayed with us, uh, my, my lady and my, myself, for about uh, three days. We, we worked all day long on songs for that eventually be, became heathen. And we went out night to the, the same the sushi place. He loved sushi every night. And we, then we went to the, the video store and rented things like Requiem for a Dream. And we went back home. And, and then like the third night at the sushi place, the Japanese lady said, I know you're somebody. She said to David, <laughs> you're somebody. I know you are. I know you are. <laughs> so it's a great nights. way to get back together. <laughs> and uh, we did Heathen after that. We went up to uh, uh, the Catskill Mountains, found this wonderful studio called Allaire. Yeah. And really dug our heels in there. We spent about seven weeks up there and made heathen. And I think, I think uh, for folks who aren't familiar with it, and you should all be, it's underappreciated, and I think people are, we were talking about this yesterday, people are rediscovering a lot of his catalog, and Heathen is, yeah. is a really solid album from beginning, yeah. from beginning to end. We're, we're running a little short on time, and we do want to get to some Q&A. Let's talk about, you know, he, you made reality, um, it was sort of, again, part two to, to Heathen in yep. many ways. He toured that incessantly. He had some health problems. Um, and then I assume you didn't hear from him for a while until the next day. No, actually, I heard from him all through that period when yeah. he, he was silent. I mean, I had lunch with him one, one day, and uh, I, it was sushi. <laughs> David likes sushi. Yeah, he <laughs> Take loves away. sushi. <laughs> and uh, we spoke about normal things like our families, our children. Sure. They're all in school now. And, uh, you know, my, young, my younger daughter is, where are you? There's Laura. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey. <laughs> and uh, then, then at the end, I, I said, well, are you writing anything? He goes, no, I haven't written a thing in years, and I don't care. Interesting. And I went, okay. Cool. Great. Yeah, I, I was already working with other people, too. And I, I thought, okay, if, I, if, if reality was my last Bowie album, I, that was my last Bowie album. And sure. He looked really happy and a little more weight, maybe, you know, but yeah, yeah. he was definitely in a, good, in a good space. He just didn't feel like uh, writing or recording. So it, I saw him on and off during that period. You know, he, we lived very close to each other in, in Manhattan. And um, let's see, uh, the next day came about with the same, you know, the phone call, but this time. This time it was different. He goes, I'm going to make an album, but you have to be sworn to secrecy. And this is where I heard about that, you know, now it's ubiquitous, the NDA. Dum, dum, dum. You know? And uh, you can't say a word about this. Meanwhile, he was the worst. He would tell everyone he's making new album. Right. He'd bring his friends in. Yeah. <laughs> We were stum, you know. Even even outside the studio, Earl Slick would be smoking or something like that, and uh, uh, people would say, Earl Slick, Tony Visconti, hey, are you guys making a Bowie album? No. Absolutely not. What would make you think that? No, we're not. Stupid no. New Yorkers. Um, but, but it's interesting because it was, um, 
it was a, a, a very well-kept secret, but we, we talked about this also yesterday and, and when we've spoken before, that he had regained some of the enigma that had surrounded him in the early days. Not, it, I think we agreed, he, he enjoyed that because at a time when the information age had really taken hold, early, you know, this is like 2012-ish, he, he was David Bowie again, the kind of, you know, untouchable guy, which is, you know, hard to, hard to get in this day and age. And, and I must add that I think he was now getting uh, autobiographical in his writing, because sure. he always said from even earlier days, like everything you, you if you want to know about me, I've written about it. It's in my lyrics. Right. And this was more important to him now than ever before. He'd stopped communicating to the general public during that album. And I was, you know, one of the few people he'd say, like if, like if articles came up, he'd say, Tony, you do these things. You, you talk a bit about the album. Keep it to the music, you know, which was really, really hard to do. Because occasionally I would let go of something like... Uh, so while we were having lunch, we watched a, a, a funny video from England, and he blew up when I said that. He goes, that is private. He goes, you mustn't, I told you, don't talk about me, talk about the music. But it's, you know, you know what journalists are like? Yeah. <laughs> what was the show? No. So I mean, I'm not, I'm not a professional interviewee. What were I'm, you eating? <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm not a pro professional was it interviewee. Sushi? I don't know how to do that. You know, yeah. I'm, I just, bl yeah. I'm a blabbermouth. You know? Yeah. Um, and yet there, you know, Black Star, just a couple of years later, seemed like such a huge left turn yet again. But we, we were talking about this, he always loved jazz, and there were hints of it on the next day, weren't Oh, when there? he was 16, he idolized Jerry Mulligan. And right. he always baritone wanted to sax. He always wanted to buy a, a baritone sax, yeah. which he only got like around the time of Heathen. He actually owned a baritone sax. <laughs> They're expensive. And he wanted, he loved, uh, there's a guy, the trumpet player, who was a singer too. There's a Chet Baker. Chet Baker, yeah, he loved right. Chet Baker. And Stan Kenton, and right. you know, we, um, we worked with Maria Schneider, yeah. and, um, and that was like a dream come true because she actually worked under Gil Evans, you know. So all his, he was fulfilling all his bucket list for making a jazz album, a jazz record. But, uh, you know, we got, to, with, with Sue, the, the record Sue, uh, we, we got like the Stan Kenton sound, you know. Right, which was the big sound. Never, it's never an old fashioned sound. Yeah. But when we met Donnie McCaslin and his band, that was really, really special. That was a jazz that, he, a kind of jazz that even David and I didn't know existed or, or dreamed of. So we were listening to Don, he told me, he says, go and listen to this band because you have to produce the album with me. You know, you've got, you've got to speak their language. And I, I, <clears throat> I, got, I got every record I could find. I saw them live once. And I said, wow, this is just going to be a fantastic Because he didn't album. want to make a mainstream jazz record. No, he wanted he, to make something it had to be a Bowie record. Special. Right. Yeah, it had to be a, a David Bowie album, yeah. And it was great the way those guys, you know, what was shocking about them was they, were, they got the concept of each song so quickly that their take one was usually brilliant, and they would just come in the control room and sit down and go, okay, what's the next song? Because that's the way jazz musicians work. Yeah. You know, each, each, each jam is priceless, you know. Right. So we, we got them to uh, overdub bits, and it's like we, sh we were making it, you know, with the, making a rock album sensibilities with overdubs, and we got Donnie to play like seven sax parts, things like that, which turned them on. You know, we were sure. bringing our, our ethic into their world, and they were bringing their ethic into our world. So it was a beautiful hybrid album uh, that, that actually turned out really, really great. And by all accounts, he was having the time of his life during those sessions. He was what? He was having the time of his life. He was fulfilling oh. that bucket list, but they were happy sessions. He sang every take. You know, this is un you know usually if you say work to a click track, David right. in the old days would sing to the one take, and because it's, everyone's playing to a click, he'd come back in the control room. He had to be out in the studio every time the band did a fresh take, and he would keep singing and keep singing. And what I, I realized was he was building up his chops for the, the day when we'd go back to my studio and he would do proper vocals. Right. But some of his takes were amazing. Only, if only he wrote lyrics. You know, he was just going, making up words on the spot. And he hadn't written, maybe Sue was the only written song finished with finished lyrics. 
Interesting. Like Black Star came, like, oh, he spent loads of time writing lyrics for that. And, and you said he works, you know, you, you referred to this a few times early on, that he, he worked slowly. But these were songs, did they come over the course of the sessions? Did you see him working on them? Or were they songs he'd bring in and say, this is what we're going to work on today? It, it was like any other David Bowie album. Some of them, he had made home demos. By now he was pretty nifty with his uh, little 24 track. He had a 24 track recorder. Mm -hmm. And he'd, he'd make some really hot demos. And one of them was, was released, uh, Tis a Pity, She's a Whore. Sure, it's a good demo. The, his, yeah. his demo was fantastic, you know. And um, so it was, it was like just the, the old days, but, you know, new technology. And his demos were pretty advanced. Lyrics always came later, though. Yeah. So it was like any other Bowie album. Uh, it was just different in the sense that we were making this hybrid jazz album. And... and You've said this to me before, but you, you did assume there was going to be more, didn't you? Oh, yeah, this wasn't our last album. He, yeah. he, he already told me that he started to write the new one, but I never heard the, what he wrote. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, look, I, we could obviously uh, keep going. We could have gone longer on each of those topics. I tried to give you an overview because everybody has a favorite David Bowie period, so I wanted to get to as much as possible. There's probably... Uh, questions in the audience. There's mics on both sides. If you'd like to line up um, and see Margo and Simon over there, um, we can take a couple of questions before we run out of time. Mike is on that side. Oh, uh, Simon and Margo. I'm sorry. Mike is right there, but Mike, do you have a question? <laughs> let's, let's start with Margo over here. What, what do you have? Hi there, um, my name is Matt Collins. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to comment on this, Tony, but um, sort of inspired by some of the lyrics from Black Star, where he says, somebody took his place and bravely cried, etc. And then later he says, I can't give everything away. Um, did you guys ever get into conversation about um, his feelings about IP and maybe the future of IP relative to those lines? The future of what? Intellectual property. Intellectual property. Oh, IT. Okay, I think I, it was I International P. Times. No, P, P, um, sorry. P is in property. P is in property. Oh, property, property, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, about no, the brand. No, I don't know. We didn't know we didn't get into those, into those conversations. We usually talked about simple things. <laughs> <laughs> like where to have sushi, apparently. <laughs> sorry. Uh, next question over here. Hi, Tony. I'm Steve. I'm from Brooklyn. I was, one of my first questions was, what part of Brooklyn were you born in? What neighborhood in Brooklyn are you from? Diker Heights. Okay, cool. And Shout out Diker Heights. And then I lived in Red Hook as a little kid, and then I lived in Bay Ridge. Awesome. Uh, my, my main question was, you worked on a lot of epic Bowie albums in the beginning, and then these last few albums. And as a lifelong Bowie fan um, and a musician, I've found these last three albums to be his best work personally. And I'm also a recording engineer, and just the production and the quality what, are you, what is your take on that? Do you find that you are more happy with the beginning albums you did with him or the later albums as an engineer and a producer? Um, we always used the technology we had and e even if we would, you know, worked in that Studio F, we made it work for us. And, and I, you know, my, over the years, my, we both got better at what we do. I mean, I progressively got to be a better engineer, although, in later years, I, I thought it would, uh, you know, I'm a, music, a fully qualified musician, so I, I, I would rather work on the music more than the engineering on the sessions. So if we have a room full of music, uh, uh, musicians where after we record drums and piano and guitars simultaneously, I bring in somebody that I really appreciate, and I've recently been using Kevin Killen as my uh, tracking engineer, and because he, his sounds are just, the best, you know, they, they really, for me, it's like everything's clear and everything's full and all that. But after that, I take over and I'm, I'm a real nerdy mixing engineer. I, I love to do tricks. I love to make up new sounds and I'm always challenging myself. And uh, I'd always like turn around to David and I said, what do you think of this? And he'd be beaming and be smiling and he didn't even want to know how I did it, you know. <laughs> he just, he just, this is what our relationship was like. I wouldn't interpret his music sonically. I'd often play on, on it. So we, we kind of, uh, we were like, 
you know, when I worked with David after the tracking, that was big, that was serious, you know, that was big boys game, but we were little boys when we were mixing the album and doing the vocals. We were just playing, playing around. But, you know, I was, I was made, made sure I didn't distort that much. <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. Over here, what do we have? Um, hi, uh, I heard that you worked, um, while you were working on Black Star, uh, both you and David were really inspired by both uh, Death Grips and Kendrick Lamar. Um, uh, which I just find really interesting uh, based on the contrast of both David and Kendrick and Death Grips. And I was just wondering, what was it specifically about both Death Grips and Kendrick Lamar which you thought um, was brought into Black Star? And we were listening to Dolly Parton as well. Okay, cool. Um, now, we, we used to listen to a lot of records. Uh, we, we also listened to Sun Kill Moon. That made a big impression on us. Uh, he, he wrote an album, uh, Mark Kozelik, wrote an album called Kozalek, I think his name is, wrote an album called Benji, which David played me a track off that, and he says, and I said, oh my God, this is the saddest, darkest thing I've ever heard in my life. And, you know, we'd often, like, uh, talk about, like, he says, yeah, he says, yeah, I can't get through this album without crying, and neither can I. Uh, but for Kendrick Lamar, all I can say is that he was inspiring. We, we would put that to pimp a butterfly on, and we would just um, be amazed about, not so much the production technique, but about him as a, a person. He was just so, he was like multitasking with the lyrics. He could change his voice. I think maybe, uh, this is just me speculating, but David could change his voice too. And, I, and uh, that's, that's what I think he admired a lot in Kendrick Lamar. But, but, but that album, would, we would kick off the day sometimes, just play it. But it didn't, it didn't change the way, say, for instance, Mark Juliana played drums on the album. It's, it's just something that was inspiring, that somebody, I know what it was, because Black Star was so um, unique, and, and he didn't, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, he didn't bow to any current trends. You know, he wanted to do something that was completely different, and he wanted to do it his way, and that's exactly what Kendrick Lamar did. He made the album the way he wanted to make it, and it was almost David looking, listening to a kindred soul, a kindred spirit, you know. Uh, I, I still like love those tracks, and uh, I, I listened to that one particular album a lot, yeah, you know. Yeah. But we, like, we couldn't make a Kendrick Lamar album, that's sure, not sure. in a million years, you know. But it was inspiration, that was the main thing. Let's get one more over here. Uh, Nathan from Las Vegas, I made a black star shirt for tonight. Uh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> the Sharpie. Uh, Shout out for yourself. You. Good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you dressed yourself. Well done. <laughs> Mr. Visconti, when did you become confident as a musician to take on uh, producing records? Uh, how did you start as a musician learning instruments? And uh, would you be so kind if I left this up front uh, to sign it? I'll sign it. Thank you. Uh, I started, uh, my first recording session was when I was 11 years old. No, I was 12, actually. And, uh, but by 13, I was doing a lot of local sessions as a guitarist. And I always, like, had to go in the control room, which was always, you know, they had a, a console maybe about three feet wide in those days. And I was always curious how you got reverb on a record. That was got, that's got me into wanting to be a record producer. Well, where does this friggin' echo come from? <laughs> You know, and where does the like the slap back like oh, 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 oh. where does that? Th I thought people sang that way, you know. So I I couldn't be satisfied with just playing guitar. I had to know all those tricks, and then uh, but I never really got a shot at becoming an engineer or a, a producer in New York. It was when I heard the Beatles. They were doing tricks that were unbelievable, especially if you listen to Revolver. And I highly recommend you listen to Revolver on Acid, <laughs> as I did. 1966 Acid. <laughs> and, and you know, yeah, this is from, from Sandoz, Switzerland, this acid. If you could only get that. And you know some serious shit is going on, you know, in the, in the recording studio. So that's when I said, I've got to get over to England. I've got to find out how those buggers do it. And uh, so that's when I blossomed and I learned the tricks pretty quickly and, you know, everything kind of accelerated then. That's when I knew I belonged on that side of, you know, I, I didn't stop playing an instrument, but 
I really love being in that chair. I love being the producer. Thank you. Take away English acid. Do we have time for uh, one more over here? Yeah? Okay, go ahead. Hi, I'm Brenna Ehrlich. Um, my question is, we all know that Bowie was really good at impressions in the studio. Um, what were some of your favorite impressions in the studi studio, and did he do impressions in the studio with you? He, he could impersonate anybody. He, he, his American accent wasn't bad, uh, but he would always, when I did a British accent, he said, that's not a British accent. And, <laughs> and I'd say, that's not an American accent. Yeah. But he did, uh, he did like Anthony Newley, he could do that, you know. What kind of fool am I? You know, he could do that really, really well. Um, I don't know, that's a good question, but I mean, he just wouldn't sit down and do impressions for us. You know, he, would just, <laughs> he could do Mark Bolin really well. He could do Mark Bolin, yeah. Did, and, uh, did he do a Tony Visconti? I'm sure he could, but... He, <laughs> didn't do it in front of you. <laughs> But he, he did like, he was quite fond of New York accents because he had a lovely driver called Tony Massio, was it? Massia, Tony Massia, who was a real Brooklyn guy. Oh, he did a good Mike Garson impression too. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he took the piss out of me is basically what he did, yeah. He did Brooklyn really well. <laughs> The clock on the wall says we're only about half an hour over, so... Oh, okay. <laughs> um, should we wrap it up, or do we have... We can take one more? Have Let's another lady come up. There was, we yeah. Do we have Good. one over there? I, I, oh, you want to take this? Sure, yeah. Go ahead, sure. Um, I, my name is Dalith Hall. Hi, Mr. Visconti. Um, I actually just finished reading your autobiography, uh, Bowie Bolin and the Brooklyn Boy, very entertaining. And uh, so I think many of us know that... that David had a, an interest in and did some study of Buddhism, and I found out from your book that you did too, and I'm curious whether you guys spoke of that or whether you feel that it influenced your creative process, the way that you worked together in any way? Buddhism. Yeah. Yeah, David was, uh, like, you know, this was a big thing in the late 60s. I, I used to, um, we both read the books by this guy pretending to be a Lama, Labsang Rampa, Rampa Labsang, his name was. He was actually a German journalist who... <laughs> <laughs> who read all these uh, stories about Tibet and he, he presented it as an autobiography. And David and I kind of read these books in our teens and we thought, my God, we got to meet Lapsang Rampa one day. <laughs> but, you know, his name was actually Fritz Kreisler. Who knows? <laughs> but anyway, that led us to Buddhism. And, um, well, it was, it was authentic, except it wasn't a Tibetan Lama, you know. <laughs> and again, you know, t Tibet was always shrouded in mystery, and, and, uh, but finally, because of the, uh, you know, the revolution, the uh, Chairman Mao sent a lot of Tibetans, you know, killed a lot of Tibetans, and a lot of lamas escaped in, by the southern border and went into India, and we actually met a Tibetan lama, two of them, which is Trungpa R Rinpoche and Chimi Rinpoche in the in I think about 69, and both of them came to a show that we, we put on. Like, oh, wow. David met Chimmy Rinpoche by accident in the um, Tibetan bookstore in London. And uh, he, he just wanted to buy a greeting card, and the woman <laughs> said, uh, oh dearie, you're interested in Tibetan Buddhism, are you? And he said, yeah. He goes, well, we happen to have a llama downstairs, you know. <laughs> and, that, and that was Chimmy, Chimmy, who is my Still my teacher, although I, he lives in London and I live here, and uh, David and I studied with Jimmy for a, a while. David for a brief period. But uh, it was things like, um, you know, Buddhism, I, I could, there's no, you know, I don't know, it's got its uh, spirituality, which you could question, did these things really happen? But you can question that about any religion on earth. But it's kind of, it gives you, in, it gets you into that Zen mind, which he liked. Mm -hmm. He liked Zen Buddhism, where like, Till, till the end, like, I love that, you know, Brian Eno card deck, uh, oblique yeah, strategies, yeah. where anything is inspirational. Literally anything can inspire you to write something or leap into the, uh, a leap into the dark and, and rely that that's always safe to do a thing like that, to take a chance. So mm -hmm. that's what we, we both kind of got out of Buddhism. Like, you know, anything is possible and, and all this, even all you people, and all that, you're just a figment of my imagination, you know. <laughs> Which is kind of psychosis, really, when you think about it. 
But, uh, but that's what we, you know, we took like a lot of good lessons from Buddhism without being, uh, here's the word I'm looking for, without being devotional. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but it had a big influence on both our lives. Thank you, that's fascinating. Thanks. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming. I think Margot is going to come up and say a few words. Um, I hope we got, uh, you know, there was a lot to cover. Uh, uh, obviously, Tony had a long and storied career, especially his work with David. Um, I tried to touch on everything, and I think Tony offered some story, a lot of stories you haven't, I haven't heard before, so it was kind of cool and interesting. And, you know, one of the things I, I was striving for in doing this, and it's really hard with somebody who everybody admires like David, is to humanize him a little bit. You know, there, there's a lot of humanity in a guy like him. He was a really funny guy, uh, which a lot of people, you know, forget or don't really focus on. So I think what I, what I tried to do with the questions and kind of guiding the conversation a little herky-jerky was to try to get to the humanity of the guy. So uh, thanks, Tony. Let's give Tony a big round of applause. <laughs>